Thank you very much, and thank you for the opportunity to speak, and thank you for the introductions. So, um, yes, I'd like to tell you a little bit about the process we've been through to deliver the innovation, and a little bit more about the technology itself and how it hangs together, which hopefully will resonate in terms of application here in the UK, but also beyond, partly because it brings together the energy sector, but then also brings together waste too. So to pick up the thread from where, where David left off, um, National Grid and the other distributors of gas across our network have seen the importance of developing renewable gas. And to do so, we've seen enormous growth over the last few years in anaerobic digestion, biomethane plants delivering to the gas grid. And this has been a very significant growth story, good story in terms of where things are going. The challenge we have is despite around 70 projects across the network, is the quantity of gas that produces is around two, two and a half terawatt hours. Our domestic gas consumers at the moment use around 300 terawatt hours. So relatively small quantity against that. Clearly there is vast opportunity for growth for that technology itself, but there are limits due to the nature of the feedstock and the size of the plants. So what we need is a step change in the volume of renewable gas that we can achieve. And that's really where we're driving forward in this bio-substitute natural gas project, is to take that two and a half terawatt hours and to produce more like 100 terawatt hours. This is using the UK's indigenous biomass resource. But by going for a different technology, a thermal approach, we're able to process a much wider range of feedstocks. And I think what's particularly important is when you look at where our UK resource comes from, it is dominated by our waste streams. We're a relatively small country in terms of land area, but a very high population. That means that much of our biomass resource sits in those waste streams. Now that's not necessarily a model limited to a country that is small. It also applies to large cities and other applications around the world too, where again, the biomass resource sits like that. So how do we convert that resource into biomethane? We've simplified the process here. Uh, as, as David has said, clearly the first and foremost, we must recycle what, we've, what we can from our, from our household waste. First, as a householder, and then secondly, you can have secondary recycling that we can do. Then we need to convert that solid into a gas, and we're using gasification, a proven technology, and we'll talk about that a little bit in a moment, at large scale in fossil fuel contexts, but we're using a different approach, but fundamentally gasification, to turn the solid into what is called a syngas, which is a mixture of carbon monoxide and hydrogen, and it's the foundation of our chemicals industry, which we can then process and clean, and then rebolt together to give us the methane molecules that we want to be able to distribute around the network. And because of the biomass content of that feedstock, that is renewable carbon that we're distributing around the network. We then need to strip out excess carbon dioxide, and then we produce the product that we're talking about. To do that, that enables us then to deliver decarbonized heat and transport. Now, many of the aspects of this SNG technology are done at large scale around the world. So, for example, if we take methanation, there are large methanation plants operating in the US, in China, which are taking coal-based feedstocks and methanating them. The difference is that that's happening at gigawatt scale and waste and biomass resources are not quite at that scale. Therefore, you need different approaches that work at smaller scale, suiting the arisings. And the other big challenge is the gasification itself. High temperature gasification of coal-based feedstocks is established and has been undertaken for decades internationally. The challenge is how to do that at smaller scale on these more heterogeneous, different waste type feedstocks and make that work. And the challenge is to have a very clean gas that the catalysts can cope with when you're actually trying to achieve that. This is where we partnered with uh, Advanced Plasma Power. They have their gas plasma technology, and this is using a fairly conventional fluidized bed gasification at the front end, followed by a plasma to treat that gas downstream. Now, that plasma does two things. One of them is it actually stabilizes some of the co-products that come out, the ash, and Tim is going to tell us a little more about that after I've spoken. But the other key aspect and key in this 
aspect of what we're talking about in the flow scheme is it provides a very high quality syngas, a chemicals quality syngas we can then put through conventional processing in order to then catalytically convert. And this cycle is a, this is an advanced plasma powers infographic that shows a really useful cycle, taking our waste resources, bringing them around, converting them, taking them, in our case, we're looking at substitute natural gas for both transport and heat applications, but potentially you could take to biofuels or electricity, and even indeed the trucks that we've got here transporting the waste can be using the biogas, and you have a fantastic circular economy with that waste feedstock. So how have we gone from this great idea to actually delivering it in practice? And again, this is, I guess, a case study in that innovation process. We started working together with National Grid in 2010. We put together a feasibility study and brought in advanced plasma power. So then together we developed the process. Then in 2014, we secured the funding to build a pilot plant. And I'll talk a little bit about that. And then at the back end of 2015, we then secured funding to build a much larger scale, a scale up, you know, a substantial scale up from 50 kilowatts for the pilot plant to around three or four megawatts for the commercial plant, which then allows us to roll out much larger scale commercial facilities at around 10 times that scale. And that's the process. It is around an eight year development that is not inconsistent with other innovation technologies in this kind of space. You need these solid platforms that you can move forward. So if I can just talk about the pilot plant, we commenced that project in 2014. Even though it is only producing 50 kilowatts of gas, that's enough for maybe between two and, and five homes, that kind of scale, uh, it is a large plant because bringing it back down is, is always a challenge. It's also highly uh, instrumented with lots of analysis and equipment. That project we put together as the core consortium with a German partner who helped with one aspect of the project. As David has said, we had the network innovation competition from Ofgem supported that, and we also received European funding. Now that project, we put together and built the plant, and we've done a lot of testing over the last year. We've learned an awful lot of things from that. Clearly, we've learned a lot of technical things. We had models, we had lab work that we did, and we validated that lab work at a pilot scale which has been very successful. Clearly, we've built a lot of operational experience in doing that. We've been able to analyze the environmental impacts, and I think this is really quite important to see. Here we have in kilograms per megawatt hour the emissions from fossil gas and how our gas, having taken a full life cycle approach in terms of our emissions, so we're achieving substantially over an 80% reduction in doing that. That is before we've accounted for the displaced displacement of waste to landfill with the fugitive methane emissions that leads to, which would make these even negative at that point. And then there is a very interesting part that because of the technology, we actually produce a side stream of CO2, and that CO2 stream is suitable for utilization or capture. Were you to do that, then you can see we achieve genuinely substantially negative carbon emissions. And we've been able to assess the commercial opportunity and the affordability, demonstrating that from a waste feedstock, with the kind of quantities and rollout we're talking about, we have the potential to deliver gas, renewable gas, at parity with fossil gas. Having done that, we then, as David said, secured funding for a commercial plant, substantially larger, and we'll talk about the scale in a minute and some of the attributes of it. Again, core consortium added with other partners, so CNG Services, a company dedicated to seeing uh, natural gas used in the transport sector, and clearly renewable gas offers those significant carbon benefits, and the local gas distribution company, which we will be connecting this plant to and delivering gas, and again funded through our network innovation competition from our regulator Ofgem, and has been said, substantial funding from the Department of Transport Advanced Biofuels Competition which means this plant, in addition to being connected to the grid, is primarily there in order to deliver gas to a local haulage fleet that is already running on compressed natural gas. So this is the project. We have secured residual waste. This is after recycling from our local borough council. Uh, as David said, in Swindon, which is probably an hour and a half uh, west of here we are in London. We're also going to be testing on, on, on wastewood. 
We have the advanced plasma power gas plasma technology, which is converting that to a gas. We have AMEC Foster Wheeler providing the methanation facility that operates and the scales we need to converting that gas into the methane. We have those CO2 sales, and interestingly in this project, we will be physically selling CO2 into the industrial market. So it is a carbon capture and utilization project. We'll be connecting to the grid, and through that grid, we will then be delivering uh, gas to a local haulage company that has a fleet of around 50 vehicles that will be running on renewable gas due to this project. As David said, it is the world's first grid-connected, full-chain, waste-to-SNG project, and that will operate under commercial conditions. The idea of that plant is, once built, it will just sit and run. The technical people won't be allowed to fiddle with the plant and change things and understand things. It will run under commercial conditions, which then allows us to have the necessary evidence base for investors to invest in larger commercial plants for rollout. So briefly in numbers, we'll be taking around 10,000 tonnes of residual waste. We'll produce 22 gigawatt hours of gas, or if we think about it, that's around 75 trucks worth of gas being fuelled or 1,500 homes being heated. And in fact, we'll be doing a mixture of both because of the way the project is set up. It's a £25 million project. That project alone will save 5,000 tonnes per annum of CO2. We'll be creating jobs. And the key thing is it enables the production of substantial quantities of green gas on into the future. And this is our vision, really. Through developing this technology, we could address around a third of the UK's domestic heat demand, or alternatively, all of the HGV fleet. And one of the important things to say here is whilst there are many solutions for electrification of passenger vehicles, those options don't lie for heavy goods vehicles, and actually gas is a very good way of reducing that carbon footprint. Um, when it's renewable gas, it's very substantial savings. So we have enough gas to produce either all of the domestic heating or 100% of the HGV fleet and 100% of the UK's bus fleet. So that gives you an idea of the quantum that we're looking at. And what we're expecting that to come through is transforming those sectors through city-scaled plants that are using local resource that is otherwise a discard discarded resource back into the energy sector to tackle a carbon problem that we're looking to address.